Shomrabyug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sherlock. Sure, listen, the podcast taking a pop at culture. Sure, look, sure, listen. 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 Sure, look, Benjamin, we don't have time for anything this week because those Americans, as you know, they had their big and famous World Bowling Championship this weekend. And for some reason, Benjamin, everyone's watching the Bowling Championships. So all of the studios are putting all of their trailers into the Bowling Championship advertising scene. So we have to look at Indy 5 Blo- you've just written Indy 5 Bloody Ben I don't know if there was a joke there originally but you've written Bloody Old Indiana Jones number 5 it's coming out also Porsche Ben Transformers and Hypocrisy we've also had a bit of news about the latest Riddick film in the Riddick series and the latest Riddick film in the Fast series Fast X and finally after all the excitement we've seen the trailers for both Flash or as it's also known Batman Far From Home and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Never you mind that you've also (laughs) seen the Harley Quinn Valentine's Day special and all of Vox Mac in the Season 2, Benjamin. (laughs) No, you can go ahead now. I'm not going to interrupt you again. I did a whole bit. Sure, listen, Michael, if that wasn't enough, and it really isn't for a weekly pop culture podcast, we've also taken a look. It's Michael, it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, thanks. I love you yeah. lots. I oh, love you lots. A, thanks a lot. Yeah, platonically, though. Platonically, though, as friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As, a, as a couple of pals. Just a couple of pals. A couple of pals who spend a lot of time together. That's yeah, all. Yeah, as the old vine would say, Michael, two friends podcasting six feet apart. Because yeah, they're yeah, pals. Yeah. Because they're just pals. Just yeah. normal pals. Just normal pals. <sighs> but uh, yeah, happy Valentine's anyway. You kind of took the sting out of it there with, you know, just forcing the platonic upon it. But that's that's okay. We also took a look at some tropes, Michael, that can warp your mind. Warp oh. your mind, Michael. Go on. Make things not so good. So we'll be taking a look at some classics, Michael. We'll be taking a look at the massive age gap and why American movies seem to be absolutely fine with it. We're going to be yep. taking a look at the inappropriate confession, Michael. Nothing says I love you like standing outside your best friend's house and having a set of cards that proposes your love for his wife. That's yeah, great Yeah, especially stuff. if it's Kira Knightley. Absolutely. We have a good, good old-fashioned stand by your crazy man. It's not him. I can change him. He's really a nice guy, said nobody ever. Uh, and then finally we have, I'll never give up on you. Not mm. for all the tea in China. Uh, and they really should, Michael, because otherwise it's called harassment. So we're going to take a look at a few of those tropes. And we have a few little gems in there as well that I haven't mentioned because we want to keep you listening to the end. We've really decided to have an upbeat and positive take on love for this year's Halloween. Not Halloween. What's this called? <laughs> love This Halloween. is the Valentine's special. Valentine's. That's what this is called. For this year's Valentine's Day special, we've decided to have a very upbeat episode. Michael, speaking of things we've made up balls of, Indiana Jones 5 is coming out. Oh, very exciting, Benjamin. This was a bit of a non-event of a trailer, wasn't it? Michael, it's a snippet. It's a taster. Just a teaser. Just the tiniest little tease of Indiana Jones and what he's going to be up to. And Harrison Ford's terrifying de-aged face. Why is that there? What are they doing? They're going to go back in time, Benjamin. We're going to see Indiana Jones fighting Nazis. And there's a fella and he's still a Nazi. And Indiana Jones is going to give him a big punch. And that's all anyone ever wanted from Indiana Jones, Benjamin, was a cocky American punching Nazis. That's all we ever wanted. We didn't want Crystal Skulls or Shia LaBeouf. No one wanted Shia LaBeouf. No one wanted Crystal Skulls. We just wanted going, hey, are you a Nazi? Well, I'm going to give you a big punch. And then he gives them a big punch. Now, the no. main concern, Ben, the internet has with this is it's introduced a new wild card in the form of Indiana Jones's first ever female character. <laughs> first ever female character also and known as lot, Phoebe Waller-Bridge it's a lot to take Benjamin because this has been a series which traditionally hasn't had any female characters but now there's going to be one so you can see there's a big change yeah traditionally Michael it's just had a series of cardboard cutouts that we called women 
Right, go on. I stuck them in there. And sometimes they had a little voice box attached that would let them scream for Indiana every once in a while or take a shot. Those were the two functions that the cardboard cutouts had. <laughs> now, I don't think that's very fair, Benjamin. I was doing more of a joke, Benjamin, than that. Of course, there have been women in Indiana Jones. We've seen loads of them. No, I was there just being was, a sexist. You were just being a common regard and sexist, Benjamin. Yeah. There's yeah. Marion. Yes. There's whatever the blonde lady's name from Temple of Doom is. That's good. Nothing says I respect women like, what was her name again? I can't remember her name. I think she was married <laughs> to Spielberg. What was her name? I don't know. Uh, um, is it Kim Cattrall? I don't, no, I don't then know. There was, no, that was Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, it was a, she was a Kim Cattrall type. Um, yeah, 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 hang on. I'll look it up. You spin your wheels. Wasn't she the mother of the actress who was in Grey's Anatomy? I can't remember. Then there was Marion again, I think. Yeah, she came back. Marion too, Electric Boogaloo. And then there was uh, Marion again, I believe. And um, and Kate Kate Winslet, not Kate Winslet. Kate Capshaw. <laughs> Kate Blanchett. Was the name. Kate, Kate Capshaw was the name was of the woman from the second one. And she played Willie Smith. Willie Smith, exactly. You never would have gotten it. I just you never would have gotten it. Oh, Old Willie Smith. Benjamin, in the olden days, that was a person who made Willies, but not anymore. Benjamin, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Go I'm on. neither excited nor dreading this. It, it, I, whatever. Let's have I, it. I honestly it don't mind, plate. Michael. As long as he punches one or two Nazis, I'm in. As long as he punches a couple of Nazis, Ben, and then they serve it to us hot on a plate like a monkey brain. Yeah, then I'm in. Sold. Then we'll go and see it. Very good, Benjamin. Speaking of Nazis... Go on. Don't Porsche have some cheek? Now, I don't quite understand your your umbrage at Porsche. I, I don't quite get it, Michael. Okay. So, Benjamin, this is, this is apropos of the new film Transformers. Some of them are cars and some of them are animals, I believe it's called. Right. That's the name of the film, which is coming out. And in that film, Benjamin, there's a, there's a Porsche, there's a car dressed up there's a transformer dressed up as a Porsche car yeah I'm sure you've seen it it's Mirage and it's Mirage Benjamin exactly but Mirage Ben even though that that looks like Mirage that mo- that character design the car that he transforms into everything about him except his Mirage creating superpower is very much Jazz the character Jazz yeah it's Jazz It's Jazz. Now, you'll remember, Ben, Jazz was killed in the first Transformers film by Megatron. I don't. I am fairly certain there's an hour and 40 minute black hole in my memory where I blocked that out. That was, Benjamin, that was because every time there was a female character on screen in an Indiana Jones film, you went into a stupor. But Benjamin, (laughs) look, Jazz, Megatron went, I wonder what he looks like in two pizzas or something. And he ripped him in half, remember? Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. Megatron's a real dick. But Benjamin... The reason Jazz has been in the Transformers movies already, and I think he was like a Pontiac Solstice or something like that, and not a Transformer, was that Porsche very famously said in the early 2000s, Transformers is not a brand that is up to the scratch of the quality of company that Porsche wants to work with. Oh, really? We We are not interested in war toys and violence. Okay. And... I tell you what, Ben, the absolute cheek of them. <laughs> Michael, they've because only gone what? and put themselves in the logo. They've only gone and they've gone, oh, it makes a lot of money, does it? Oh, well, everything we said back then, that was just bollocks. Because once we've seen that it makes a big load of money and it's not just niche transforming toys, then our entire moral stance, we're willing to back down on that. How about we use the character who was famously a Porsche? How about we use the character Jazz? And then the Transformers people said, well, guys, actually, I'm sorry, but we killed Jazz in 2007. As a little middle middle finger to you, the company Porsche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he wasn't a Porsche, though, was he? Because they couldn't, he couldn't be a Porsche. Because they weren't um, allowed. Porsche, exactly, Benjamin. Porsche and BM and Volkswagen, excuse me, were the two companies, and they're kind of nearly one company. Porsche and Volkswagen share ownership. Do they? Um, they do indeed. Yes, I think uh, they used to be kind of two companies owned by one family, and now I think Volkswagen own Porsche. Michael, why do you know so much about car ownership? Because Transformers, Ben. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. You have because a fetish I'm- for Transformers. Deeply, deeply care about Transformers characters being the right characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this being Mirage, this, this Porsche being Mirage 
is like for an X-Men fan, an X-Men fan. If you got a new character in the next X-Men film and he jumped down off a building and he was wearing like a, a rippling muscled chest piece and he had a long brown duster coat yeah. and he had a bow staff and he charged some telekinetic cards in his hands and then he said it's me bub I'm the best I am at what I do hey that's not Gambus no that's Wolverine yeah but we didn't really have the rights for Wolverine so we just made him Gambit no oh, one dear. will care will they will oh, anyone dear. care no one cares that's how annoying this is for Transformers fans Ben and it's all because of the hypocrisy of big companies and they'll change their mind if it looks profitable enough for them. It is quite interesting, Michael, that, you know, 20, well, how many years ago did Transformers come out? 15 odd years ago? 2007. 16 years. 16 years. That makes me feel old. But anyway, 16 years ago, Michael, it's interesting. We're now in late stage capitalism. So the only way to make money in America <laughs> is through violence and death. So the poor yeah. just going to be like, OK, well, I guess I guess we're Transformers people now. I guess, I guess we're Transformers people now. Um the the change was obviously Bumblebee. For some reason, Bumblebee they licensed Volkswagen licensed the famous Volkswagen Beetle for Bumblebee. Yes, and yes, yes. That was yes. the first time they'd ever licensed that car for Transformers. Oh, and that just opened the floodgates, and now Porsche like we you can put any of our cars in it. Go on, you go right ahead. Put some cars you in. Go him. ahead. Yeah, is this Yaz? Is this the character Yaz? No, it's the character Mirage. Get out of here, Porsche. God damn it, Porsche. Speaking of anyway, strange things that nobody that's my rant about Porsche. <laughs> Get out of here, Porsche. Nobody's got any time for you. <laughs> and your dumbass characters. It's like that scene where you're trying to send the dog away in a movie, but it keeps coming back because it's so loyal to you, and you're like, Get out of here, damn it. Yeah, Get that's the here. film Stray, Ben. Oh, that's the film Stray. Which we're not talking about this week. You're Which we're not talking about this week. Up. Why are you making things up and putting them on the running order, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. I'm an agent of chaos, Ben. Benjamin. Yeah. The only good thing that might come out of it is they might back backward license a jazz toy. And would that make you happy? Final, that would that would chill me out a little bit. Just a touch. If we f- if we finally got an officially licensed Porsche jazz action figure, then I'd chill out. But otherwise. I don't want to hear anything more out of you, Porsche. He's coming for you, Porsche. He's coming I'm for coming you, for unless you, you unless retroactively you license some jazz figures. You retroactively license some jazz action figures, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Michael, speaking of things you'd probably enjoy a retroactively licensed character figure for, um, yes. we got some weird news this week. What is it? R- Riddick Furia is being made. Hooray, Benjamin. We're truly living in the Vin Diesel and Renaissance. What's going on? Michael, this this one, we have we have a rough outline of a plot. Um, Riddick finally travels to the lost planet, his lost home planet of Furia. Um, mm. And he finds that, oh, wait, wait. He thinks the Necromongers are going to have, you know, ravaged the place. But it turns out, Michael, there's a new alien threat. And he discovers some Furians fighting for their lives. So good old Riddick has to get his his goggles dirty again and hop into the fray. Benjamin, I didn't see this trailer during the bowling championships. No, Michael, there was nothing on during the Super Bowls. Um, The Super Bowls did not feature a trailer for this. This was just an announcement in Deadline Hollywood. Um, ahead of something else. But I tell you what we did see in the old Super Bowls tournament. What did we see in the old Super Bowl tournament? The Super Bowling tournament. Michael, it's Fast X or Fast 10. (laughs) Fast 10, Benjamin. How has it happened? How fast 10 your seatbelts, Ben? (laughs) (laughs) If that's not the tagline, Michael, if they don't take that and run with it, I'll be so upset. How have they not thought of that fast 10? That's ridiculous. Um, sorry, what was I saying? No, it, it, we just we got a trailer, Michael, and I, I was thinking to myself, you know, how are they going to make this bigger and better? How do you? How, who hasn't been in the Fast, <laughs> Fast and Furious franchise? And then I heard the dulcet tones of one Jason Momoa. Yeah, boom. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, so it's Jason Momoa. <laughs> Jason, Jason Momoa in hasn't been in them yet. Just. Just fling big men at it. Just fling Hollywood big men at it until one of them sticks as the next Dwayne The Rock Johnson. 
but Michael, what's hilarious about this is they have retroactively licensed that character and put him in the movie. So I think it was Fast Seven. Is it Fast Seven where they pulled the the bank vault job That's in Fast Brazil? Fast Six, I believe. Is that Fast, Fast Six? six. Well, it turns out Jason Momoa was there the whole time. He was in he one was of there. those cars. He was there the whole time, Benjamin. Like everyone in every episode of the Fast franchise, he was there the whole time. Benjamin, I've actually seen the script for Fast Eleven. Go on. And... Do you remember in in the first Fast and Furious movie? Do you remember the truck that they stole the DVDs from? Yes. Well, his brother Ben, he's <laughs> back, <laughs> and he's gonna get revenge on La Familia. La and Familia. And he's just gonna go, ur, ur, and he's gonna just drive, and it's gonna be about a self-driving truck. That's the brother of the truck that they wronged fifteen years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's that's quite possible, Michael. I wouldn't put it past them. So everybody seems to be in this, Michael. Everybody. Everybody's in it. Except Jatham for The Rock. Is back. Because they the don't Rock's get on. The Rock's not back. No, they don't like each other. The Rock's... I, I was really surprised to see John Cena back. He's back. And I think he's, he's on their side now in traditional As Fast, per, and Furious Fast and Furious tradition. form. Yeah. yeah. All he's is back, forgiven. Come back to the familiar, you know. Yeah. Because someone worse is coming. It's Jason. It's a slightly pudgy Jason Momoa. Now, Benjamin, I don't like to body shame Hollywood big men. You certainly do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's what I meant yeah. to say. Yeah. But uh, Jason's he's, hes looking a little bit, looks a little bit soft. He's going through a divorce. Is he going through a divorce? Yeah, he's in the middle of a separation. Oh, no. From from, from 90s, from certified 90s body, uh, Lisa Bonet. Oh, is that right? Okay, yeah. poor Jason Momoa. That's probably why he's looking a little bit soft. This yeah. um, this almost looks like a parody of itself. I know we say that about every Fast movie, but, I mean, what's going on? Why is Brie Larson in it? Why what? is she there? What's going on? What, what is the overlap between Fast and Furious viewers and Brie Larson fans? Who's who's looking at this and going, what this series needs is Jason Momoa and Brie Larson. Let's I... get them both in there. <laughs> get Statham in there as well. Can we get Cena? Cena's actually... Oh, he's here. I didn't notice. Um, <laughs> Very good. Thank you. It was a wrestling joke. Um, but it's, it's just weird, isn't it? It's weird. Like, how many times can they just keep going back to the someone who was there during another incident that happened and we didn't know about it story? I, I guess it's endless, Michael. I guess... <laughs> You know, it's just bizarre. What, like, So we got to meet Dominic Toretto's mother, by yes. the looks of it. At the start of this trailer, was she ever has she ever appeared in the franchise before? Benjamin, I have absolutely no idea. To be honest with you, I know Helen Mirren is Statham's mum. Is that Helen? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in in the Fast and Furious lore, but now we wait. Do you think we're going to get a Helen Mirren versus Dominic Toretto's mum scrap? I think we might. Oh, that'd be good, wouldn't it? And Don, Dominic Toretto's mum turns out to be a bad egg. But yeah, then, um, she's evil. She's evil, but then Ben in the next one she'll be grand. Once she'll that truck grand. comes back, she'll be welcome back. Once, once that truck comes looking for her son, she's gonna welcome everyone back into the. Oh, it's ridiculous! There's two things I can't in this believe one. This. <laughs> There's two things in this one, Michael, that make me a little bit wary that Fast and Furious may have outlived its hype. <laughs> oh yeah, little. You're just a tiny bit wary about that, are you? Okay, just a tiny on. little bit wary. One is, <laughs> for some reason, yes. Michelle Rodriguez utters the line, game recognises game. Now, that line has been out of date for quite a while, Michael. She does say that. She does say that, Benjamin. She says that to Brie Larson, of all people. And the other thing, Michael, is there's a child actor. Now, far be it for me to cast aspersion on the noble and long-lasting profession of child acting. But fuck me, that shit's hit and miss. It's fair, It's where you got your start, Benjamin. Is that the baby <laughs> who they rescued from the airplane in the previous one? I don't fucking know. It's his I, son, according to the trailer. Oh, yeah. Well, then it is, isn't it? Didn't Statham go on the airplane to rescue his son with uh, with his brother, Count Dracula? I don't I don't know. Was, is Luke Evans still alive in the Fast and Furious lore? He died in I like six. So. No, he didn't. He was grand. He got better, remember? And he helped <laughs> Jason Statham. Fuck off. Cause, cause, when did that happen? He's, he's Statham's brother. He's, um, he's Helen Mirren's other son. I know, but he died, didn't he? No, he teamed up with La Familia. No, that's why Jason Statham killed Han. And then yeah, didn't but then kill he got Han. better too. Or did he? Yeah, but then <laughs> both Luke, what's his name? Luke Wilson? It, Luke Wilson. Yes, Luke Wilson is probably in these films somewhere. Both Luke Wilson and Han got better. 
I was gonna I was gonna make a very distasteful joke about Paul Walker there, but I don't think we can, can we? No, yeah, he's the only one who's not coming back. Maybe. Yeah, that was anyway, the joke I was gonna make. I bet the Fast and Furious executives are really fucking scheming at how they can bring Paul Walker back in real life, yeah. so they can bring him back in the film. Yeah, if only the real life worked like that, Benjamin. But I mean, Fast and Furious has gone way beyond comic books now to the point where not only, like, think of all those comic book tropes that used to be ridiculed, like nobody stays dead. And then every time two characters meet, they have a fight and then they're friends. Yeah. Like, that's just the entire... This is... I think the Fast and Furious movies are, in the truest sense, the successors to comic books. Much more than comic book films. Yes. I would agree. They're just ridiculous. Anyway, Benjamin. Probably the biggest trailer of the um, superior bowling competition... <laughs> Was Flash uh, Flash Gordon Gordon's alive <laughs> Flash We've only got 14 hours To save the timelines Flash Flash I love you Oh Flash King of the impossible Played by Vin Diesel Gordon <laughs> Yeah yeah Vin Diesel should have played the Flash Benjamin The Flash is just like Hey guys We heard you liked Spider-Man No Way Home So we put some Batmans in it What do you think of that? So this is this this is so interesting to me, Michael. So we're obviously talking about the Flash trailer that we got, and it, it is so righteously unearned of them to tell it's this brilliant. story. It's brilliant. It's great. It's like the whole collapsing DCU is still built on the shaky foundation of Man of Steel. That's my favorite thing about this whole thing. They it's just keep mental. <laughs> they just keep throwing back to Man of Steel and going, Do you remember Man of Steel? That was seminal, wasn't it? Zod is back. Zod is back, Benjamin. What would have happened to the world if Superman hadn't been there? It's like fuck, I saw that once in two thousand nine. I don't remember it. We're gonna have to rewatch it now. I'm gonna have to watch all of them. <laughs> Because, Michael, here's the thing, right? They've done this. This has been done yes. three times as an experiment now. Four times. So what we got was Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And let's be honest, I think that might be a touchstone for when timelines in movies stopped mattering. Or okay, dimensions yeah. in movies stopped mattering. Into the Spider-Verse is a phenomenal animated film where the rules of regular canon and one universe storytelling are cast aside in favour of a madcap romp, and then everybody went, oh, that made a lot of fucking money. Go on. Whoa. And then it happened again, Michael, in Avengers Endgame, where we played around with it a little bit. Only a little tiny little Only a little again, tiny right? little bit. Just a little bit of time travelling. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, go on. But then, Michael came Spider-Man No Way Home. And we went, fuck it, let's do another Spider-Man All the Dimensions. Get all the boys in there. Get everybody all loved, in there. Everybody loved Tobey Maguire, even though he was a creep in that film, Molly's Game. He's creeping loads of stuff. Yeah, he's yeah, just he's a creep, the, apparently. Yeah. Everybody loves Andrew Garfield, even though he's too tall and too handsome. He's too handsome. Andrew, if you'd like to be on the podcast, please get in touch with us. Hit us up. Benjamin, and then everybody said... Wouldn't it be amazing if we did this but with Batman? And then a lot of people arguably would have said, no, actually. Um, <laughs> it's like, entirely don't. unearned. It's, it's totally unearned, you see. A lot of those movies had at least three or four films before them leading up to this with little hints here and there that it might be possible. Oh, yeah, but what if we just didn't do that? Yeah. What if we're going to restart the whole DC universe starting from... Is this going to be the restart? Is this what's going to trigger it? I am imagining they're pulling a Flashpoint flashpoint wiping the slate gig. But okay. Michael, it's so unnecessary. It's yeah, it, There's two flashes, Ben. Michael, there's two flashes. The only thing, and as we know, the only thing worse than one Ezra Miller is two Ezra Millers, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> That's too many. I think the plural of Ezra Miller is actually Ezra's Miller. Ezra's Miller, okay, it's one yeah, of those. That's too, too many, many Ezra's, Ezra's Millers Miller. spoil the pot, Michael. One Ezra Miller spoils the pot, as we know. They yeah. are they are no good. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be really confusing for people who get upset about Ezra Miller identifying as they, them, when there are two of them. Yeah, and then it's actually appropriate to say them. <laughs> oh, do you, not, do you not think it's appropriate to say them at any other time? Oh, no, I absolutely do, Michael. Saying. Hence the reason I refer to them as they. 
there I a moment gotcha. ago. I got you, Benjamin. There a moment I ago. You, you snared me. You, sm- yes. you snared me in semantics, you son anyway, of a gun. Benjamin. But come here to me, Michael. I think the reason people should be upset about this film is because Ezra Miller is a fucking prick. <laughs> I think the reason people should be upset about this film is that Michael Keaton's not playing old Batman. He's, He's playing young, a- fucking <laughs> superpowered Batman. <laughs> He's flipping and jipping about the place, Benjamin. He's going to break his hip. Somebody watched Arkham Knight, the video game, and went, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's just do, do that. that. And okay, Michael, like t- I have to say, some of that CGI... Oof. Well, look, they'll fix it in post, Benjamin. They'll fix it Benjamin, in post. Did we know we were getting both Batman in this? or No. What did we know? Because this has been so confusing with... Is Keaton going to be in Batgirl? Is Affleck going to be in Batgirl? Is Keaton in... Is Keaton in Flash? Is Clooney in Flash? Is 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 Bale in Batgirl? It's so confusing. I do a weekly pop culture podcast, Benjamin, and I can't rem- I can't keep all of these rumors and stories straight. Michael, you texted me frantically in the middle of this week and said, "Ben, I need you to come up with a concept for Batman's Nespresso machine. It's for a thing. Don't ask questions." And I, I dutifully set off doing that, Michael, and it could not, for the life of me, figure out why you wanted Batman's Nespresso machine mocked up. But I went about and did it anyway, Michael. And you then you informed me... <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was a spectacular job. I know, I had great fun. I have a lot of fun making the crazy things that come out of your mind, Michael. It's, it's, good, it's good stuff. Bit, uh, incredible bit of work. But I'll tell you what, Ben, it's all just rumours and swirling, and no one knows what's going on in DC. It's mad shit altogether. I don't think Ben Affleck knew he was in this film. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Famously, Gwen, Gwyneth Paltrow didn't know she was in Avengers. Did she not? No, no, she didn't know she was in Spider-Man. Oh, okay. Well, that makes more yeah. sense. So it's probably a bit like that. They probably don't know what they're filming a lot of the time. Yeah, they're just told to come in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Benjamin, what's your take on in a world without metahumans? It looks like Supergirl was in some sort of prison and Batman and the Flash are going to break her out to save the day. So there's there's several things going on here, um, Michael. One one is that it is the original Flashpoint story. In the original Flashpoint story, Superman is kept in a prison under a red sun. Oh. And he is depowered. He's kept away from the empowering rays of the the yellow sun so that comes directly from the flashpoint comic but in this they've made it a lady oh we won't like that benjamin because this is the first ever female superhero the first time it's ever happened michael first time it's ever happened never happened before (laughs) anyway look anyway benjamin i'm fascinated by this i'm not excited by it I, i it's just bewildering it must be so bewildering for people who don't keep track of this sort of stuff. Just, I think that the trailer is even... Did you get a little bit of a feeling that it was trying to imply, but not state, that Christian Bale Batman was in it? Oh, there's, there's some... The the bike, Michael, at the yeah. start, that's the bike yeah. from Christian Bale. Isn't it? Yeah. Now, I know, I know Affleck Batman drives a bike like that as well, but... It looked very much like they were trying to say, and Christian Bale, Batman's going to be in it too. Do or is you he? Have any, do you have any money that we could have? <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if you give us some of that money, we'll tell you if he's in it. But it's it's so interesting to be Michael because I don't think, I don't think they have the rabid fandom of the MCU. I don't think they have that. I don't know, Benjamin. I think that uh, we're on the cusp of a... I think we might be on the cusp of a swing the other way where DC starts doing better and Marvel starts doing worse. Okay, well, you heard it here first, folks. We're on the cusp, we're on the edge of glory. We're on the edge of glory. Speaking of Marvel doing worse, Michael. Yes, go on. we got a oh. trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Oh, you've taken a shot at Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> Volume 3. I see what you've done there, Benjamin. But Benjamin, there's teamwork and camaraderie and sadness and classic rock songs. Yeah, that was good in the first two, wasn't it? <laughs> and the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker and Suicide Squad and Peacemaker which arguably did it better um, which is I wouldn't say that Benjamin get let's the fuck out not, of here get the fuck let's out not of here. throw the baby out with the bathwater. water no, it's too late I've done Guardi- it now Michael 
Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 is a fantastic film. It's the it's the thing and that made me pay attention to the MCU, Michael. You're right. Exactly, Benjamin. And nothing that's happened in the declining quality of the MCU since then can take away from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 as a standalone film. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is a weaker follow-up, but it's still a good film. Mm-hmm. Um, three remains to be seen. But I'm of the hope that this is going to occupy its own little part of the Marvel Universe and not be too tied to the declining quality of all the rest of the stuff and we'll get a somewhat satisfying conclusion to this trilogy. And then, thank the Lord above, I can stop watching them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to close the loop, Michael. They have to. It, it's time. It's Let your last quality franchise ride off into the... Yeah. <laughs> no, just completely humiliate the character of Star Lord and wrap it up. Wrap it up. Yeah, um, Benjamin. I tell you what, it looks like a lot of people are going to die just from this trailer. Ah, oh, Drax is gone, isn't he? Oh, for sure, Zos. For sure, Zos. That's, that's what the trailer wants us to believe at yeah. the very least. So it's probably actually going to be Rocket. I, I mean, raccoons don't live very long, so. He probably should be dead by now. But Michael, this raccoon's been experimented on by the higher evolutionary. Oh, I know him. He was in Peacemaker. He was in Peacemaker. He was in Peacemaker. He was the same actor. The higher evolutionary, Michael, is the villain of this one. And it's I think it's a classic X-Men villain. Um, more often than not, we see him deal with the X-Men quite a bit in various are you saying the? Are you, are you saying the higher evolutionary? Do you yes, intend to well, say the high evolutionary? No, that's the guy who smokes too much weed and thinks that he understands Darwin's theory better than Darwin. <laughs> oh, James Franco played him. James Franco plays him in everything. No, you're right, yeah, Michael. Yeah. It's the high evolutionary. I'm sorry. The high evolutionary he, is the correct answer. It's but, James Franco on the Galapagos Island looking at finches going, man, some of those beaks are different. Yeah, and he got it. He got it in one. But uh, come here to me, Michael. The high evolutionary is there. He looks to be a bit of a, a classic kind of bloody... Genetic experimenter, a little bit of a... I, I quite liked Rocket's line, the one little snip we get him is like, no, he just didn't like things the way they are. Um, it's yeah. not that he wants things better, he just doesn't like things the way they are. Um, yeah, and I was like, good. oh, very good, very good. Um, there's an otter with a prosthetic, Michael. Yes, a love interest for Rocket, maybe. I, I think, Michael, I think the mm. reason that Rocket Raccoon has stolen so many prosthetics over the year is for his long-lost pal, and he constantly seeks them out to give them as gifts to his long-lost pal. I would put my fucking money on it. So cute, Benjamin. Ben. Yeah. I am most excited about seeing Adam Warlock. He looks like he's going to be quite a Superman-style character. Yeah, he looks like he's going to fuck shit up. Yeah. He's going to be whizzing through things and just flying through stuff, Captain Marvel-style. He's going to. He's looks like he's going to be giving it socks, Michael. I'd say they end up becoming pals. You're going to end up becoming pals. Pals. You're thinking of Fast and Furious. Oh, I'm thinking of the franchise Fast and Furious uh, yes. 12. Adam Warlock joins the gang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adam Warlock joins La Familia. La Familia. And rather than flying through spaceships at like cosmic speeds, he drives an electric car. Yeah. And everybody makes fun of him until they see him street racing it and they go, oh shit. Oh, Warlock's, shit. Warlock's got game. And then Michelle Rodriguez pipes up going, game recognizes game? And she drops yes, off. Yes, exactly. That's exactly yeah, yeah. what's going to happen. Um, Absolutely fabulous well, stuff. <laughs> answer me this, Michael. How the fuck is Gamora in this film? She came back from the dead, remember? When? She. There were two of her, remember? The main timeline one died oh, yeah. and then the other one got brought across from the other. T- you were saying this earlier, remember? You were the one who brought up characters coming across different timelines in Avengers. I did, yeah. I did bring that up directly. That is actually literally what I did. You did, so she's fine. She got better. I liked the little joke about Peter Quill falling in love with Nebula. I thought that was quite funny. That was the, the they put that in a little stinger at the end. Maybe that's the new love interest, Michael. Maybe maybe Zoe Zaldana notably said, "No, I don't want to be anywhere near Chris Pratt. Please, please rewrite that particular love interest." Yes. Thank you. And Disney said, "Zoe Zaldana, blessed to be her name. Anything that you are in becomes a multi-billion-dollar franchise." <laughs> For some we reason, will, we will get rid of any number of Chris Pratts. At your behest. At your behest. Just stay in the film. Just be in the film. You don't have to be necessarily the main star. Just to be in it for us. Just just, just pop your head in the door once or twice. Yeah. Huh? That's why uh, 
the character, the film The Losers was such a big hit. Yes, notably one of the biggest hits in film history, Michael, starring one Jeffrey Jean- Dean Morgan. Yes, um, and one uh, Chris, Christopher Evans. One of Christopher, oh, remember him before he was Captain America and huge. When he remember was just, that? he was always just having a laugh. He's always just there for the bants, there for the lols, <laughs> there for the giggles. That wasn't a bad film, Michael. Wasn't a great comic, but uh, no. yeah, just poorly timed, I think. You probably would have gotten away with that. It's very Peacemaker-esque in some of its touches. In many ways, Benjamin. Benjamin, it's happy Valentine's Day today. Michael, 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 today is Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you platonically. Oh, thank you very much, Benjamin. Hmm. Now, it seems like there hasn't been any special Valentine's Day content this year, or has there? Oh, Michael, oh, Michael, you hold your bloody horses. What is it? Michael, the only thing I've seen that is any way Valentine's themed is the Harley Quinn Valentine's special. Oh, sounds great. Yeah, it wasn't. But, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the important thing is they tried it. My- Michael, speaking of things that somehow mysteriously survived cancellation in the the Great Warner Purges of 2022, mm. yes. Harley Quinn, the animated series, is still going. One of your favourites from the last few years. Um, genuinely was in season one and two. Two very, very good things. I haven't seen season three, but I'd imagine it's kept its tone, Michael. Very irreverent, very uh, canonically playful, Michael. A lot of messing around. So, a little bit to catch you up, Michael. Uh, the Harley Quinn animated show, starring Kaylee Cuoco and one Lake yes. Bell, Michael, um, mm. have, have done what many people said would never happen. And they give us a fully lesbian relationship between one Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. Oh, did people say that wouldn't happen? I thought that had been a thing for like 15 years. It was always heavily hinted at in the comics, Michael, but they never pulled the trigger. But in the Harley Quinn animated series universe, Harley Quinn is 100% gay and with Poison Ivy. Oh, I thought she was with the Joker. Yeah, she may be bi. I may be misrepresenting bi's there. Sorry for making bi people invisible. I apologise. I take it back. Um, but in this, Michael, um, the Valentine's Day special is all around Harley and Ivy's first Valentine's Day together. Are you implying that John Cena is a bisexualist? No, not because they're... No, 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 Michael. Very often, bi people are overlooked in media and television in favour of aligning them with either one, a fully homosexual male, or other, a fully homosexual lesbian. And bi representation is something that we don't necessarily see in film and TV. Therefore, I I apologised because I had glanced over what is possibly a depiction of a fully bi character. I see what you're saying. I see, right. And it's nothing to do with being invisible. Physically, it's it's nothing actually that. to do with being invisible. It's to do with being media invisible, Michael, whereupon the media doesn't focus upon you. Ah, very good. Okay. Ben. Yes. And is it lovely? Um, look, it's fine. It's grand. <laughs> the, 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 no, look, one of, the, one of the strangest things about it, Michael, is it has a bloody cameo from Brett Goldstein. Brett the Hitman Hart. No, Brett Goldstein. Him off the Ted Lassos and him off the, the Hercules at the end of Thor Ragnarok. Oh, he's going to be Hercules. Okay, what's he doing there? Yeah, so he's in there for no reason other than to read Byron poems shirtless while polishing his Emmy. So that's the whole joke. Um, you can go to a Valentine's evening of Brett Goldstein reading the poems of one Lord Byron. Oh, he's playing himself. He's playing himself. And it's actually him. He gives a whole monologue. It's very entertaining. Um, What's Lord Byron, then? Lord Byron is a poet, Michael. Uh, Lord Gordon uh, Gordon Byron. um, And a very famous romantic poet, uh, famously writing the lines, We'll go no more a-roving by the light of the full moon, etc., etc. Some very, very famous poems from one Lord Byron. You should listen to my other podcast, Michael, Words That Burn, if you'd like to learn more about that. Benjamin, I can see why he called himself Lord Byron, because Gordon Byron is not a very romantic name. It doesn't have the best ring to it now. I'd say Lord got him a few more ladies, all right. I would say so, yes. Please read another romantic poem to me, Gordon. (laughs) Yeah, no, it wasn't going to do much. Wasn't going to do much. Notably, why Commissioner Gordon was single in most depictions of Batman. Just couldn't get past the name. And why Flash Gordon tried to go by Flash. Yeah, 100%. But uh, it was fine, Michael. The The central conceit, they seem to have really leaned into their, their teenage humour days. The central conceit is that the Bane character of the Harley Quinn universe, who you'll remember is incredibly inept, Michael, um, and oh, yeah. is portrayed constantly using the voice of Tom Hardy's Bane. 
<laughs> from yeah exactly and they do it exactly like that that was a spot on Harley Quinn animated series Bane um, thank you very much impression. everybody I'm here all week so they they go with this conceit and he's been turned giant um, and he has a giant erection and is very very horny and sets about the city fucking buildings oh that's great class great crack, crack, crack all together and then one of the one of the strangest scenes that we get, Michael, is um, Harley and Ivy hopping into bed, which I could only describe as full fan service. Oh, very good. Very strange. Very just wow. Very strange scene. Sounds sounds highly erotic, Ben. It it really wasn't because you're very aware that these characters are drawn in a very cartoonish style, and you kind of just go, oh, okay. Um, Some- some people are into that, Ben. I, 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 I think a lot of people are probably into that, Michael. But I'm unfortunately not one of them. Um, in this particular case, I was like, okay, that's a weirdly place. I'm, I'm against sex scenes in films and TV at the best of times, Michael. Are you? That's interesting. I, I find them utterly pointless. Go on. I feel that they almost never drive a, a story or a scene. Benjamin, I, I, you've obviously never seen the love scene in Terminator One. Michael, I know for a fact that the love scene in Terminator 1 does nothing to propel that story along other than give them John does Connor. Everything to propel the story along, Benjamin. Yeah. This is the most important scene in the whole film. There's nothing I dislike more, Michael, than a gratuitous sex scene. I can't stand it. I'm an utter prude in that regard. It turns out your entire generation are prudes, Ben. But Ben... <laughs> um, what's gratuitous is about the sex scene in Terminator 1, though? It's, it's all sexy. Because it's sex. It's, it's all sexy, first of all, which is great because there's a bit of titillation and there wasn't that much titillation in the 80s. Also, it gives us John Connor. Yeah. Also, it goes from... Uh, it, it heightens the stakes of the movie because now... What's his name? Kyle Reese isn't just uh, trying to protect her. He's also trying to get the ride. And... He is, yeah. Yeah, and it develops both of the characters where where uh, one of them's trying to get the ride and knows he's going to die and the other one's like, um, oh shit, I've lost my point now. Uh, sorry. You were talking about how sex scenes propel narrative, Michael. Not always. Not always. And more and more these days, Michael, bloody gratuitous, I tell you that much bloody... Oh, family. right, okay. You've never sounded older, Benjamin. I'm a very anyway. old man, Michael. I'm a grumpy old man in a 31-year-old body. But anyway, speaking of uh, cartoons that don't necessarily over it on the gratuitous sex scenes, we yes, got they the do, end... Ben. Huh? Yes, it does. There's <laughs> we been ra- more gratuitous nudity in Vox... Vox Machina actually has gratuitous nudity. <laughs> in that... It is just gratuitous. That's all it is, Michael. Titillation for titillation's sake. Exactly. Um, but in this, Michael, we wrapped up Vox Machina Season 2 this week. Um, we got episodes 9 to 12. and Sorry, 10 to 12. And yeah, Vox Machina have completed their Season 2. The Chroma Conclave, uh, Michael, um, is still at large. But uh, Vox Machina, and spoilers for Season 2 of Vox Machina, they defeat Umbrasil, the acid-spewing dragon from the opening pilot. He was a real dick. He was a real piece of shit. Um, And they got their vestiges, Michael. Now, I have to say, this really kept me strapped in from start to finish, Michael. I know we had our criticisms of it as a, a bloody finder's quest from a video game. Or from yeah, a, it was a very much it was very much a video game structure this this season of go and get these things. Yeah. So that you can go and fight that baddie and he might keep popping up and trying to stop you. Yeah, it was very Final Fantasy meets dice and uh, otherwise known as D&D, Michael. But in this particular yes. case, uh, the, the character work here, Michael, towards the end of that season, phenomenal. I loved learning the little backstories of, see, I've never had the joy, Michael, of watching Critical Role. I see. So I'm not necessarily familiar with these characters or their backgrounds or what's happened before. So quite often I'll tune into a new episode of Vox Mac and I'll be like, oh, this is very good. And then everyone will tell me how it's diverged from the original canon of Critical Role because they got rid of this or they got rid of that. Um, yeah. And, and now Jazz is a Porsche. Now Jazz is a Porsche. Um, bloody Will Poulter is in Fast and Furious. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, but anyway... I thought the character work by the end of the season was very, very strong. I enjoyed watching the characters come into their own. Scanlan gets a big old boost. Um, there's a bloody Irish woman's a D&D, Michael. There is, there is, Benjamin, in my favourite episode, which is the Grog episode. Go on. 
Um, I, I loved the whole thing of Grog being small and weak. I yeah. thought that whole bit was absolutely hilarious. I loved that whole scene. I liked the background to Grog where Henry Winkler, the Fonz, um, taught him to not be a violent thug all the time. Yeah. And he has to stand up to his uncle. That was all brilliant. And then a genuine Irish woman suspense with an Irish accent played by an Irish actress. And oh, it was great. Top class representation, Michael. We're all for it here. And uh, she Absolutely looks to listen to the podcast. Fabulous stuff. Hiring Irish people to do Irish accents. It's about time. It's about Love to bloody see it. time. Um, so yeah, I, I went watching that. Um, and uh, I just thought it was really good. I thought they really tied it together. I think the Grog arc was probably my favourite as well, Michael. From uh, from weak Grog to strong Grog again. Have you watched it through mm. to the end? No, Benjamin, but I do know what happens because, as you said, I have seen Critical Role. You have seen Critical Role, so you know what happens. So, so Michael, it's I'm very good. It's a very enjoyable season. I think it was better than season one, which I don't often say about TV shows. Very, very yeah, strong. Yeah. We'll be watching season three. I'll watch season three as well, then. I didn't think it was better than season one because it was because of that video game-esque narrative that drove the whole thing. Of, okay. What's this week's side quest? What's this week's side quest? What's this week's side quest? It is interesting, though, because a lot of season one, Benjamin, never happened in Critical Role. Tell me more. A lot, a lot, because Critical Role, the the streamed um, D and D game, joins the story in flow. Oh. Uh-huh. Um. So. This, this was when they really got into the flow of doing the the show Critical Role. Ah. So. This this part is a lot more fleshed out and developed in Critical Role. So it's interesting to see it then, having seen it in Critical Role in Vox Machina. I see. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And only because there are interesting diversions. But it's it's definitely a better way to watch it. Like, if you're not a big Dungeons & Dragons fan, this is the way to be going about it. I enjoyed it, though. I will watch Season 3. And I'm looking forward to The Mighty Canine. I I still don't know what to expect from The Mighty Nine, uh, Michael, but we'll sure, we'll watch it. We'll watch it. We do a we'll pop culture it. podcast. We'll oh, go yeah, yeah, we'll probably have to watch it. A look. Michael, one yeah. of the things that we saw developed very heavily in season two is uh, the love of Keely and bloody Vax growing and growing, Michael. And how appropriate on this Tuesday, the 14th of February, Valentino's oh. Day. Saint Valentino's Day, Benjamin. Saint Valentino's Day. Famously, Michael, there's a whole bunch of his blood and possibly his heart sitting here in Dublin or one of his fingernails or something in one of the churches yeah. here in Dublin. I didn't have anything to do with that. Nothing. No matter to what do. anyone says, <laughs> it was nothing to do with me. Yeah, so if there is a if there is a D&D party out there, you can find a vestige of bloody Valentine's Saint Valentine's here yeah. in Dublin. Awesome. Um, you can go have a look um, but that's actually 100% true ladies and gentlemen there is there are relics of St. Valentine's who knows if they're real Michael who knows Benjamin there are relics of St. Valentine in practically every city in the world I think oh that makes me sad okay never mind we're not so special yeah, anymore sorry. a classic case of Dublin is special oh wait no actually no it's not never mind no, never no. mind St. Valentine actually lives in Florence Ben he's still there he's not even dead He's not even dead. He's kept alive by the perpetual spirit of love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what's and going on. And his desire there. to get revenge on Vin Diesel's La Familia. La Familia. For something that happened 20 years ago. <laughs> so he's gone skipping across the universe and he's enlisted the help of Jonathan Majors and Will Poulter. And now they're going to take yeah. down <laughs> anyone who's in love. Uh, and Luke Wilson. Michael, speaking of bizarre tropes that drive uh, romantic narratives, we put a little poll out to the listeners. The listeners. Yeah, on Instagram, at your Luxury Listen podcast. Yeah, yeah, hit it up. Hit it up for the latest in pop culture. Actually, there sometimes is news now, but mostly just polls about We're quite up to date stuff. these days, Michael. We're making a real effort. Terrifying stuff. Terrifying stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we asked our listeners, what do they think the worst kind of cliche in romantic uh, stories is? Uh, are, even if you speak English, the real good. Oh, I sprackens the English. So good, ladies and gentlemen. So we asked, we gave four options. The massive age gap, the inappropriate yes. confession, stand no. by your crazy man, and I'll yes. never give up on you. Yeah. And Michael, this one was the tightest poll we've ever held. A lovely, tight Valentine's Day poll. Yeah, it was very, 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 very close. Um, so uh, out in front... 
at the tippity top there. Well, we'll go from last to keep people invested, Michael. Okay. But right. one <laughs> one that I thought people would have more of an issue with is the massive age gap. <laughs> Yeah, people don't seem to mind that so much. I tell you, unless it's Leonardo DiCaprio and a 19-year-old Israeli model. (laughs) Then everyone's against it. (laughs) Fine in fiction, for some reason creepy in real life. Uh, It's very creepy in real life, in fairness, Michael. (laughs) But absolutely fine in fiction. Totally fine for Robert Pattinson's character, whatever the hell his name is, to be 117 years old, hanging around high school, chatting up young ones. His name is, um, but, in that series, he's Jeffrey Twilight, Michael, that's his name. Jeffrey Twilight, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it, exactly. Jeff Twilight to his <laughs> mates. So, totally fine for Jeff Twilight to be hanging around high school, chatting up young ones. 117 years old. Leonardo DiCaprio is less than half of that, <laughs> and he's getting grief. He, he probably so why is that his grief, not though. <laughs> Why is that fair? Why is that fair on Leonardo DiCaprio? Benjamin, one of my least favourite massive age gap relationships was from the TV show, um, was from the TV show Star Trek Voyager. Go on. Now, you've explained to me something called a mayfly romance. What the heck is that? Yeah, so a, a, a mayfly romance is a trope where there's huge disparities in lifespans between characters. Um, so uh, this uh, this is, you know, kind of a classic thing of one of the characters is a much more supernatural creature or paranormal creature and they become friends with another character um, and we soon realise through the horrific uh, thing of chron- chron- uh, through yeah, the yeah. horrific reality of uh, biology Time. and chronology that one character is going to live much longer than the other. Now it's a classic immortal meets mortal trope but we've seen it play out in very platonic senses. Spock and Kirk are a perfect example of a platonic example of a male fly um, kind of connection because bromance uh, Spock was going to live much longer than Kirk mm. uh, by sheer merit of his biology there's there's nothing about it um, and it's probably fine between pals it's a little bit tragic a little bit sad uh, but it gets a bit creepy Michael when we're talking about a huge age gap between romantic people romantic lovers yes. If you will, like Kez and Neelix in Star Trek Voyager. So tell me a bit about this, Michael. I don't, I don't quite grasp this myself now. Well, Neelix is an alien on Star Trek Voyager, and he's the ship's cook. And the actor who played him was probably in his thirties at the time. But Neelix very much looked like he was in his maybe late forties, early fifties. Okay. Now he he might have been younger, but they gave him the look of a kind of receding or thinning hair and mutton chops and everything. So it was a little bit odd. And Kes. Is, was played by a very young actress and came from a species that only lived about nine years. Mm-hmm. So she was a fully grown adult looking woman by the time she was three. Oh. And they... Now, I don't know, Ben. I don't know who they were fucking. I can't remember because <laughs> I blocked it out of my head. But I didn't like it. I didn't like it and I didn't want it. So that that seems to be far more. That that seems to be a nice hybrid of the the Mayfly romance and the Born Sexy Yesterday trope, Michael. Yeah, Fuck a little do we bit hate of both, that yeah. one? Lilo from yeah, the Fifth yeah. Element is a classic example of both of these tropes because technically she's only a couple of weeks old. A couple of weeks a old, old when she hooks up with the 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 hard hitting forty three year old Kevy from from the future. Yeah, and uh, that's Neelix. not great. But we've we've seen it in other places as well, Michael. Um, Highlander, one of your favorite shows. They, they're all doing it. Um, at at one point, uh, Ramirez, the notably Scottish Ramirez, played by Sean yes. Connery, explains. No, he's <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no. Explain to. We're well, I'm in Spain. Yeah, I'm from Spain. I love Spain. I'm from Spain's a, wonderful. A Spain. Yeah. Spain's one. I've lived for thousands of years. Uh, in so, Spain. Con- <laughs> Connor's mentor Ramirez explains that he was born in ancient Egypt. <laughs> well, he's not even Spanish. It's not even Spanish. He's Egyptian. I'm Egyptian. God damn it. I'm Egyptian by way of Spain. Um, or Spanish by way of Egypt. It doesn't matter which one you choose, Michael. He's been around for thousands of years. As it turns out, Michael, he's been married three times. Um, Is that all? 
during over his 2000 year life um the last time he got married was to uh, japanese princess shikiko or shikiko as he would say um, <laughs> whose ultimate genius blacksmith father made him the badass ivory handled katana as a dowry that gift is, that is awesome though benjamin it's funny we've picked all examples where the man is very old and creepy and the woman is very young and naive but we've missed one of the biggest relationships in all the fantasy where it's the opposite go on that's Aragorn and Arwen. Yeah, bloody cradle snatching Arwen, huh? Yeah, come on, Arwen. You've been an adult since before his great great grandfather was born. What are you doing? What are you at? You like, knew his da. <laughs> you knew his da's da. You knew his da's 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 da. But yeah, so that's that's kind of why the the Mayfly trope is is really dodgy because well, number one, it's it's skewed in proportion. Because you'll you'll always have far more men who are supernatural beasts and kind of ahead of the curve. Vampires is a big one. Vampires. Oh, what a sexy vampire! Says everybody. Mm. Oh wait, yeah. he's hundreds yeah. of years old. Yeah. Look, Ben. Yeah. One of the most egregious vampire ones is Angel and Buffy. Yeah. Oh, that's that shit's creepy as fuck. <laughs> Because sure, Liam was born in the 1700s in Galway on, in Ireland. I, I'm Liam and the Vampire from I'm Ireland. Liam the, I'm Liam, I'm from Ireland from Galway. Gosh. Oh. But put aside the vampire thing. He was, he, was a, he was 26 when he was turned into a human. And then he's hanging around high school. He's still 26. He's He's still, still it's still a 10 year age gap. Even Get if you take there. away the vampirism. What are you doing hanging around that high school with fucking Jeff Twilight and fucking <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio? Get out of there! That's one of the most egregious things, though. Like, I also feel like in the Twilight films, because everybody else dates other vampires, but not yeah. Edward. I feel like everybody must be going, I ah, hear, Ed. What are you doing? <laughs> what the fuck? Who's Ed? Who's Edward? Oh, sorry, Jeff. Here, <laughs> Jeffrey. Oh, Jeff Twilight. Sorry, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Twilight. Twilight. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Um, Get the fuck out yeah, of here, Jeff. Some real weird stuff. Anyway, coming in third place, Michael, to that yeah. was the inappropriate confession. Oh, go on. Uh, the deep, held back confession of love for another. Now, the 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 reason this sprung to my mind, Michael, um, is because of the classic scene in bloody. What's that film that everybody Love watches actually. at Christmas? Love Actually. Yeah, Love Actually. Um, and we got it from Andrew Lincoln, got old Rick Grimes himself. Um, mm. And he stands in front of a door of his best friend, right? Yeah, <laughs> so we're not... Tweetle E.G. for Benjamin, who's Rick Grimes? Do you mean John Walking Dead? I mean, I mean, classic zombie protagonist, John yeah. Walking Dead. And yeah. uh, John Walking Dead stands in front of the house of his best pal. Yeah. Who is uh, who is a, a classic Chris Bad Magician. It's Chichuel Effibor from... Yeah, I know. What's he What's he? Chris Bad Magician in? He's uh, Dormammu. Sorry. Or not Dormammu, Baron Mordo. Oh, uh, right, right. Okay, yeah. that, that wasn't my best work. joke. I apologise. That doesn't work. That everybody. Doesn't work. I apologise to everybody. Uh, But come here to me, Michael. (laughs) This bizarre chain of events gets set off. And not only has Andrew Lincoln known these two for years. Yeah. And never said bip. Yeah. (laughs) He waits until his best pal gets hitched to Kira Knightley. And then he decides, oh, I have to tell her. (laughs) Not only does he do that, Benjamin. He waits till his best pal gets hitched and then he waits till he's upstairs having a poo. And then he knocks on the door it's so and he bad. shows her the sign secretly while fucking Carl Mordo is upstairs having a shit. Yeah, I mean, this trope is rampant, Michael, in films, in animation, in things. And, you know, it's the big confession and it plays out roughly similar to what we've just described because what happens is this character has had long, deep-seated, harboured feelings for another character in the movie, in the show, in the comic, whatever, but they don't say anything, right? Mm. They don't make an effort. They don't try and confess their feelings. They just sit there like little lovelorn puppies. And then when that character moves on in their life, finds somebody new, then the character goes, oh, wait, no, I fancied you all along. 
the absolute cheek of them. So drop that zero and get with a hero. And then you have to stop and say, are you a hero though? Are you are you a bit of a conniving mm. yeah. L tosspot? Are you a hero or do you belong in the bin with Jeffrey Twilight? Benjamin. Yeah. I feel like we talk about Stand By Your Crazy Man about once a year every Halloween. We do. It's very important. <laughs> Very important, Michael. Um, so in third place for us, Michael, was Stand By Your Crazy Man. And this is inspired by the awful relationships that we've ex- been exposed to in the likes of uh, Harley Quinn and the Joker, where, oh, I get Mr. J. Nobody else gets him like I do. Um, and, you know, we, we have to suffer through that particular one. But that trope goes much broader, Michael. Uh, Harley Quinn and, and the Joker are a particularly uh, magnified example of that. Um, but we, we see it all over the place, Michael, where a character, a male character usually, if we're being honest, is an absolute prick, right? Go on. He's not a great guy. He's a gruff bastard or a moany dick or, you know, he's just not a great guy. But suddenly, Michael, we get a little mm. glimpse into his torment and we go, ah, Jesus, I love him. I love him. A classic example of this would be Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> oh yes All right, The beast go on. is no good He's a real kidnapper <laughs> He's not a nice person He I threatens to people's murder dads. her father <laughs> Yeah yeah Can't just go keep kidnapping people's dads He kidnaps her dad And then threatens to let him die of fear And some kind of coronary And Belle goes Ah no look I'll stay here with you Let me dad go And uh, I- I'll never fall in love with you I'll never fall in love with you The beast continues to act the maggot and in the end she goes oh do you know what I've only gone and fallen in love with you and then he gets his transformation arc (laughs) but you're sitting there going what what do you mean yeah Benjamin yeah no use don't do it it's no good you can't do that it's not okay the transformational dickhead trope is in everything it kind of it, it kind of moves into different directions Michael as you go along we see a lot of it in the I can save him trope um, and there's been a bit of a, a back curve to that now where, you know, characters realize very, very steadily that maybe they can't save this person or maybe this this person is actually awful and they shouldn't be in a healthy relationship or be rewarded in any form. I think we might be seeing a swing back against this uh, this idea. Go on. Um, now, like the, the Joker Harley Quinn thing is almost redeemed these days. 100%. Um, but I mean, when once you redeem the Joker Harley Quinn thing, the question is why? Uh, what? She okay? It's great. She she's kind of redeemed herself from being in love with a an evil man, but now she's in a a, a lesbian relationship with another evil person. Yeah, two evil people. Two evil people. But she was evil anyway. Uh, like, is she just going from one toxic relationship to another? Yeah. Or is is because Poison Ivy's a girl baddie, then it's kind of okay. The lesbians are all good. Okay, that's no, 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 no. Yeah, we've all right. We've we've done this a few times, Michael. It's fine. Lesbians are all okay, good. Okay, very good. Um, okay, good. But no, in this, in, in fairness to the Harley Quinn show, um, Michael, their relationship is very wholesome. Um, they really support each other. And Harley Quinn in the animated series is not really a villain anymore. Okay. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. The Joker has been redeemed in the Harley Quinn animated series. He now lives with a lovely normal woman and is very much oh. in love with her and has a very wholesome life and is a stepdad. Okay, so everyone's just nice in the Harley Quinn show. Everyone's just kind of nice. A bit stupid, a bit dangerous, but quite nice. Okay. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? That's lovely. Yeah, it's lovely. It's really, really nice stuff. Hmm. Really hmm. nice stuff. Um, but Ben. Yeah, go on. Our winner. Yeah. With 34% of the vote. Yeah. Was Rick Astley. Yeah. And never going to give... Never, he's never going to give you up. He's never going to give you up. And it's no good, Michael. <laughs> it's he no good. give you up for all the sand on Tatooine. Yeah, so the trope is, is technically called, I suppose, Michael, stalking for love. Um, <laughs> where it's like, I've got my mind set on you. I've got my mind set on you. I've got my mind set on you. Do, 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 do. And Michael, it does take a whole lot of precious time out of my bloody life to watch films where I have to see this happening, Michael. 
I'd like to hear about one or two. It's an awful trope, Michael, and we see it everywhere. Do you want me to read you off a little list where we see it? Go on, give you a little list there. Here we go. You ready? Groundhog Day. You've got mail. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no use. High Fidelity. Ten okay. things I hate about you. There's something mm. about Mary. The Notebook. Mm. Big Fish. Wedding Crashers. Scott Pilgrim versus the World. St. Elmo's Fire. Pretty in Pink. Dead okay, Poets Society. On. Gonna stop you for a second. Gonna stop you for a second. I, I think we give Scott Pilgrim versus the World a pass. Why? that's what Scott Pilgrim versus the World is about. That's true. That's the heart of the film. Scott, yeah, the whole point of Scott Pilgrim versus the World is this this is bigger in his head than it is in reality and he needs to learn that. Or at least that's supposed to be the point but they kind of wussed out a little bit on I, the end. I think that point is missed by thousands of viewers though. No, no one is supposed to emulate Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's the worst. a loser who, funnily enough, has an age gap. He's dating a high school girl. <laughs> yeah, stop it, Scott Pilgrim. Knives Chow, get out of here, Scott Pilgrim. Go hang out there with Jeffrey Twilight. Jeffrey and, Twilight, and bloody Leonardo Liam, DiCaprio, Liam from Galway. Liam from Galway. <laughs> yeah. In fairness, bin. Liam from Galway and Jeffrey Twilight do sound like someone that they warn you about in the local bar down the countryside. <laughs> I don't want to go over to Liam from Galway. Though. <laughs> you know what? No, you don't want to go over there. No, he's. He's no All good. But Michael, that, those are those are the tip of the iceberg on that particular trope. We've also got so some of the most egregious ones there, Michael, are um uh Big Fish. Big Fish is a, a really old Tim Burton film at this stage. Two thousand and two? No, it isn't. Is it not? Get all the way up out of here. You you spin your wheels. I'm gonna spin my wheels. Big Fish is, I suppose, very similar to Scott Pilgrim in that it's a kind of a, a fantasized storytelling version of one man's pursuit of his wife. Two thousand three. Oh, I was twenty far years off, old. Twenty years old. Get out of Get here. Get out of here. Um, and it wow. is a fun. It is a fun film, Michael. Until you realise it's about a man who relentlessly pursues a young blonde woman who he doesn't even know the name of for half the film. Know her. Doesn't he even doesn't know even know her, Michael. And he goes after her again and again. Now, it's redeemed because it's Ewan McGregor. Mm, so that's fine. And we love sexy. Ewan McGregor. But, Michael, he doesn't even know her name for half the film. Like, it's like that song, Ben, You're Beautiful. Y- yes. What? Um, You know that song where it's like, I saw your her face on the cloudy... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another. James Blunt, old Blunty boy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bluntster. Um, I'll tell you what, though, Ben. Yeah. Um, I like the films where this is a little bit subverted. Uh, it's a little bit subverted in Scott Pilgrim, but I think it kind of misses the message a little bit. Go on, give me an Do example where it does, it does it well, Michael. Well, probably the best one that does it supremely well is 500 Days of Summer. Yeah, so I keep seeing this pop up on, on lists everywhere, Michael. And what's happening on those lists is they're going, oh, it's so full of toxic tropes. No one should watch this as a romantic movie. To which I go, yes, that's the point. That's the point. He's, he's awful. He's an awful, whiny, self-absorbed man. And he doesn't deserve mm. Summer. And all Summer does is draw a boundary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great. It's a great I wish, film. I wish Padme Amidala had driven, drawn a similar boundary. Just one boundary. We wouldn't have gotten one of the universe's most villainous men, Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah, and she wouldn't have died of being sad. Wouldn't have died of being like sad, all of which the, is... <laughs> like all of the listeners who are alone on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are not alone on Valentine's Day because you're listening to us. It's absolutely Yay. fine. Do you know how you could stop feeling lonely, ladies and gentlemen? You can get in touch with us in a few different ways. You can find us on the interwebs at www.shomrebeug.com, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. You can find us on Instagram at Sure Look, Sure Listen Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Sure Listen. Oh, I hate that. It's, is it not Listen Sure? Oh, it is actually. You're absolutely right, Michael. Well done. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, the best way not to feel lonely on Valentine's Day is to hop up on the Discord where there's loads of us. We're all having a chat. It's great. Hop up on there. We're all having a chat. Sometimes we forget to post things and we're going to be better. We're going to start fixing that. It's it's all good. Um, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen. It's all good. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> it's all part of the plan. If you want to get super ready for us next week, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be doing another episode of Exhumed. We're going to take a look at the classic 80s film. Uh, bloody honey, 90s film? I don't know. Let me check. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, you- starring Rick Moranis, everybody's childhood dad. 
1989. The 80s film, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So you can watch that in preparation for next week's episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the various channels we just talked about. That's it from us. And we'll have seen Ant-Man, Ben. And we'll have seen Ant-Man. Bloody Ant-Man. Um, we'll have seen Ant-Man. That's it from us, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you next Tuesday, everybody. See you next Tuesday. Well played. Well played.